When we all get to heaven, 602, and Brother Steve will come forward. He started the song first. A little bit. <clears throat> his debut man he had a chance to hit that high note anyway we'll get him next time page 531 531 531 this is a real pretty song i like this song wonderful peace 531 Girls on third verse sing by yourselves. <laughs>
everybody. Oh, soul, are you here without comfort or rest? Marching down the rough pathway of time. May Jesus, your friend, or the shadows grow dark. Oh, accept the sweet peace so sublime. Peace, peace. we thank you once again for this opportunity to uh, worship you Lord I just pray that you'd help us as we listen to your word that we would get something from it and Lord that you would bless it bless brother Tim as well anoint him and Lord we'll thank you for it in Jesus name I pray amen you may be seated <clears throat> just a few announcements tonight we have the annual business meeting coming up the 22nd in the evening service and so come to that if you're a member as we discuss different matters and uh, that is the 22nd. Tuesday night, I'd remind you about visitation. That starts at 6.30, and we're going to be going out and uh, just visiting people. And so if you're able to come to that, we would love to have you, and we'll have visits for you to make. Also, Saturday, we have our door-to-door -door outreach. And uh, actually, the guy who's making our tracks right now emailed me uh, a proof of what our tracks will look like, and they look really sharp. And uh, so we'll be able to pass those out in the community as you go out to eat, as you go to the store, you can give them one of those and be proud that you're from First Baptist Church Amen. and uh, they'll look great. And so uh, that'll be good. Also, uh, Sunday morning series, we just started this morning uh, on the question, is anything too hard for the Lord? And so I challenge you to come Sunday mornings as well as Sunday nights. We'll continue next week, Lord willing, uh, on Complete in Christ. And then Wednesday night, we'll pick it up with our Heroes of the Faith, and uh, we'll be able to do that as well. And so you won't want to miss Wednesday night. Um, just another announcement here. <clears throat> I want you to remember Miss Crystal Sprague just in prayer. She's going to be having surgery tomorrow. And uh, I believe as a church, we should try to help them as much as we can. And uh, I was wondering if maybe we could have a couple people who may volunteer um, to bring a dinner for them, uh, to feed them, and uh, also their two children. And so is anyone interested in that, first of all? Uh, just here, okay, Miss Emmy. Anyone else interested in doing that? Okay, Miss Ursel. And then anyone else? Okay, Miss Patty. <clears throat> and this one I'm going to ask you to do. If you could just have that ready to go, um, 6, 6.30 at night, uh, somewhere around there. If you just drop it off by the church, then what I'll do is I'll go and drive it out there, and uh, you don't have to drive to the uttermost. Uh, you know, they live way out there, so um, I'll drive that uh, to their house every night and give them that meal. I think that'll be a help. So Tuesday night, um, that's the first night, so any of you ladies have a preference on that? We'll just take care of that now. Tuesday night, who would like to do that? Would you be okay with that? Okay, Tuesday, my wife and I will do Wednesday and then Thursday, Thursday, and then Miss Ursula is Friday okay? Okay, good. All right, thank you. And uh, if you're not helping with the meal, then pray for her and uh, just pray that this would help her. She said the doctors think this may help her uh, with some of her health issues. So let's pray um, that everything would go well with that as well. And remember that tomorrow, and she goes in at 6.30 in the morning, all right? Um, we have a missionary letter tonight. I'm going to read that for you tonight as Brother Tim is going to preach. But we have Craig and Fran Lingo, missionaries to Columbia, and uh, they're having some exciting times. This was written in the month of November, the newsletter, and so it's been a couple months, but uh, they talk about the camps that they've been to and the camps that they put on, and uh, they've seen several people saved as a result. Specific one named Daniela, she was saved and she's been on fire for the Lord. And uh, Daniela has an unsaved family and she was able to bring her mom and dad to church and uh, actually her mom got saved. And so that was great. And then also her dad, he's not saved and he went to church. He went forward to be dealt with, but he said it wasn't time yet. 
and he wasn't ready to make that decision. So uh, as of right now, I don't think he's saved yet. And so let's continue to pray for Daniela's dad, that he would get saved and that he would trust in Christ. And then Brother Lingo talks about uh, a certain issue that was going on at the church at this point in time uh, that he had to deal with, trying times in the church, just a discipline issue. And so uh, let's pray that Brother Lingo would continue to have wisdom in those areas and uh, that they would continue to, continue to see fruit that would remain in the area of Columbia. So let's pray for them. Lord, we thank you once again uh, for our missionaries. And Lord, we think of the lingos tonight. I pray that you would help Daniela's dad, if he hasn't made that decision of salvation, that he would trust in you. And Lord, that you would just continue to work in hearts and at the camp as well as they continue to go forth with that and continue to give Brother Lingo wisdom as well in the different areas of ministry. And we'll thank you for that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, everybody stand. Please turn to page 115. 115. Love lifted me. Page 115. <clears throat> I was seeking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. Very deep and stained within, seeking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despair and cry. From the water stepped in me, now sing, am I? Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Oh, my heart to Him I give, ever to Him I cling. So much he answered true, Mary Swiss souls the song. Thankful loving service to to him belong. Love lifted me. Everybody shake hands with one another, okay? Please, thank you. verse. Souls in danger look above. Jesus completely saves. He will lift you by his love out of the angry ways. He's the master of the sea. He'll lose his will obey. He your savior wants to be be saved today. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help. Love lifted me. comes to the point in time of our offering. I challenge you to give as the Lord has laid on your heart. Brother Lyle, if you would pray for us. Father, we thank you for this day you've given us, and Lord, for the message that we've heard. And Father, we just pray that you would give Brother Timothy as he brings the message you've laid upon his heart. Father, be with us as we take communion tonight. Father, we just pray that you would bless us. Uh, bless the offering, bless the gift and give us for this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
And uh, it's a blessing to be able to have someone like Timothy Weavy in our church, isn't it? And uh, it's great to be able to have someone who's going to be an extension one day of our ministry and go out. And uh, one of my uh, personal convictions is to, if someone <coughs> is called to preach, they should preach. And uh, so at least once a month, we're going to have Brother Timothy bring the message. And uh, I was thankful that my pastor in Indiana, when I was growing up, he would allow me to preach. And uh, it allowed me to, first of all, get used to getting in the pulpit and uh, being able to preach in that way, but also just um, the blessing that that was as a preacher. And so, as Jeremiah says, when you are called to preach, you can't but help put it out there. And so, you can't keep it in. And so, uh, Brother Timothy, you come and you preach for us tonight. Pastor for letting me preach. Um, it's actually since Pastor came and to now is the longest period since I, that I haven't preached and since this summer because uh, Pastor kept me quite busy in Canada preaching. Um, but tonight we're going to be in Leviticus uh, chapter 17. Leviticus chapter 17 verse 11 is going to be our, our main verse tonight. Leviticus 17. Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 11. 17 and verse 11, and it says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for allowing us to come to your house today and come this evening to worship you, Lord. Lord, especially this time as we come uh, just remembering the sacrifice that uh, you shed your blood on the cross, Lord, for our sins, Lord, as we take the Lord's Supper tonight, Lord, I pray that you just uh, bless this service. Give me the words to speak, Lord, that would be what you would have me to say, uh, that would speak to the hearts of those that are assembled here, and that we also uh, remember the, the blood that was shed for us, Lord, as we uh, go into the uh, communion service tonight, Lord. I pray that you bless the reading of your word, that everything would be done for your honor and glory, Lord. Amen. So tonight, we're just going to look at uh, the, the blood. My title's uh, A Portrait of the Blood, as we're in Leviticus here. Um, you know, in research for this message, I did a little bit of research about blood. Um, you know, I decided it had been a little too long since my last science class back in school. Um, but I found that blood is a bodily fluid in living beings that delivers necessary substances such as nutrients and oxygen to the cells and transport, transports met, 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 metabolic waste products away from those same cells. When it reaches the lungs, gas exchange occurs, and carbon dioxide is diffused out of the blood into the pulmonary ovially, and oxygen is diffused into the blood. The oxygenated blood is pumped into the left-hand side of the heart and the pulmonary vein and enters the left atrium. From here, it passes through the mitral valve, through the ventricle, and taken all around the body of the, through the aorta. So the blood contains antibodies and nutrients and oxygen in order to provide this work. And so I know most of that didn't make sense to you. It didn't make sense to me either. But we see that blood is necessary for life. Without, without all that taking place, we wouldn't be alive. We wouldn't be walking around. We wouldn't be breathing. I wouldn't be standing up here preaching without that blood. That blood's a necessary part of our body. Uh, any living being re requires blood. That's, that's what's necessary for life. An average adult contains 1.3 to 1.5 gallons of blood in their body. So that blood is so necessary for our life. Um, and we see the great importance of blood. Without it, there's, there's no life. You know, this is just as true in the Bible. Blood flows through the Bible just as it does through our veins. The blood of Christ uh, keeps Christianity alive. Uh, someone has said, cut the Bible anywhere and it will bleed. The blood is spoken of 427 times in the Bible. Blood flows through the Bible just as it does through our veins. Um, without the blood, the gospel is dead and we're deprived of eternal life. You know, Jesus said, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for the remission of sins in Matthew 26, 28. And Paul added, um, And almost all things are by the, by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no remission. He also explained, In whom we have redemption through this blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Um, Peter added, For as much as you know that ye are not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold, but from vain conversation received by the tradition from your fathers. And then 1 Peter 1.18. So we've seen through these verses that, you know, the blood is vital. Not only is blood 
in actuality vital for our lives to human lives and for, for animal lives and for, for living beings, but it's necessary for, uh, for our, our faith. You know, the blood of Christ is necessary for the purpose of our faith. Without the blood of Christ, without the shed of blood of Christ on the cross, we wouldn't have our salvation. We wouldn't have all the, the promises God has given to us through his son through the death on the cross. Um, the early church understood the blood. The first, the 22 sermons recorded by the four preachers in the book of Acts all give the same message, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, they understood that his death was the provision, the covering of our sins, that's what covered our sins. Just as in the Old Testament, the sacrificial lamb that was offered every time, you know, that was consistently, they didn't just do it once, they had to do it consistently. And that was to cover their sins. You know, the shedding of, of Jesus Christ's blood was that one-time sacrifice for our sins. And, and the new, early New Testament church, these early believers, they knew that. And that was what they were preaching and proclaiming to the, to the people that didn't know Christ as Savior. Um, uh, for another quote I found, this is, um, Christ, uh, God's gaze is always passes through rose-colored glasses every time he looks on the heart. You know, when Christ looks at us, he doesn't see, as, as saved people, he doesn't see our sin. You know, when God looks at us, he doesn't see our sin, he sees Christ's blood. You know, it's that blood that is what he sees that, that keeps us you know, saved, that gives us that hope of eternal life, that gives us that, that remission of our sins. You know, let's put the blood of Christ under a microscope and just do some look, study into it and some look into it. The first thing we see is an analysis. Um, the blood is perfect. The virgin birth of Christ established his righteousness. Um, Judas cried out, I have betrayed innocent blood. Paul explained, for he, God, hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might have the righteousness of God in him. You know, and we also know the story of when Christ was, uh, was about to be crucified and he was on trial and he stood before, stood before Pilate. And Pilate said, um, There was no no guilt, no nothing wrong with him. No, there was no fault found in him. Um, there was no guile in his mouth, as it says in First Peter two twenty two. You know, and John added, "In him is no sin." In First John three five, a natural father would have imparted the sin nature from Adam um, to Christ. If if Christ was born of a man, if Christ wasn't born a perfect bir a birth, a virgin birth, you know that sin nature would have passed on to him. And if if Christ had that sin nature, there's no way we could have hope of eternal life. We couldn't have had perfect blood shed if his blood wasn't perfect but christ was born of a virgin birth he had a perfect birth and his blood is pure you know after his um we also see let's see what's that next one sorry oh okay um it says behold a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name emmanuel which being interpreted is god with us now jeremiah the prophet had spoken years before this years before the birth of christ came along jeremiah the prophet um spoke and said, the Lord hath created a new thing upon the earth. A woman shall compass a man, in Jeremiah 31, 22. You know, it's certain, it's certainty that a new thing for a woman without a man to give birth, you know. In our human minds of comprehension, when a baby's born, we know that that, that baby came from those two parents. It didn't just magically appear in the womb. We know that something took place for that to happen. But when Christ's birth was, came along, it was a perfect birth. It was a virgin birth. It was a birth without fault, without blemish didn't come from mankind it came from god we also see that the application of the blood is pure um, when dr curtis hudson was struggling with cancer on a number of occasions he went to a treatment called chelation <coughs> chelation is similar to dialysis in that the blood is removed from the body and sent through a machine that cleanses the impurities from it and then pumps it back into the body you know this treatment prolonged dr hudson's life for a good long time after his blood had been purged of germs, disease, and bad cells, it was then able to work against the enemy cells that were at war, that were at war in his system. Um, so we see, you know, just as, as Dr. Curtis Hudson, a famous preacher, went through this process to purify his blood to, to make his body last longer, you know, Christ, Christ uh, imputing his, his righteousness on us, cleanses us of all sin. His blood is pure. His blood is the only pure blood that's shed. It can cleanse our lives just as... Dr. Curtis Hudson's blood was purified when it went through this machine, through, through this system, to help um, to save his life and to fight the, the disease in his body. Christ's blood is what purifies us. After, uh, let's see, after his blood was, was purified of the, of the disease, it was able to help him along. Um, we know, all know the famous song, you know, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? 
nothing but the blood of Jesus. O precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus can give us that righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus can give us that hope of heaven. You know, in the world today, many people say they're Christians and many people profess to know Christ, but I mean, a lot of preachers won't preach about the blood. They won't preach about the, the our salvation is only through the blood. It's only through Christ's blood shed on the cross. People don't want to talk about the blood. But the blood is the only way we have a hope of heaven. That's the only way our sins can be forgiven. That's the only way we can know that we're going to heaven. We'll know that we're forgiven is through Christ's blood. Peter wrote, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. You know, it became pure, it's purifying. You know, just as that lamb that, that had to be offered on the offering, it had to be a pure lamb, had to be um, blemish-free and pure white lamb, free of any defects, any blemishes, any sickness, any disease. It had to be a perfect lamb offered for the for the shedding of blood for the sin of the people in the Old Testament to, to be forgiven. You know, Christ was that perfect lamb that was shed. His blood was shed just as, as the lamb was shed in the Old Testament. You know, Christ was the lamb of God that his blood was shed for us today. You know, the animal sacrifice of the Old Testament, continuous year after year, you know, the blood of bulls and goats provided forgiveness and pardon temporarily only because it pointed to the sacrifice of, of, cross, of Christ on the cross. His blood being shed covered all, covered all of our sin. The writer of Hebrews speaks of Christ as one who needeth not daily, like those high priests, to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people. For this he did once, seeing he offered up himself. So if we think back to the Old Testament tabernacle, before the priests could go and offer the sacrifices for the people's sins, they had to go and offer sacrifice for their own sins because they were just as guilty sinners as the people that were bringing the lamb to be slain. So they had to go first themselves and get their sins forgiven, their sins covered in the blood, and then they could go and, and part for the people and offer the sacrifice for the people. But when Christ came on the scene, he was the high priest that didn't have to do that. Christ was pure. His blood was pure. He never sinned. So he was the high priest that didn't have to have his sins forgiven. He was able to give us that eternal forgiveness you know, the priests in the Old Testament tabernacle could only, you know, we'll say give the people temporary forgiveness because he wasn't perfect himself. He didn't have pure blood. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't God. He wasn't Christ. So he could only give the people, you know, a temporary forgiveness. And he could only part for the people temporarily. And then he'd have to do it again and again and again because he himself wasn't pure. But when Christ, the perfect high priest, came, he was able to forgive shed his blood and forgive, give forgiveness for all our sins, you know, the sins that had occurred in our past, the ones that are occurring on a daily basis, or any sins that might happen in our future. You know, he was able to give forgiveness for our sins forever. Again, Paul tells us that, you know, neither by the blood of goats and calves was his own, but by his own blood he entered into once, entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us in Hebrews 9, 12. And then again, but now once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself in Hebrews 9, 26. And the Bible says, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. Just as the priest had to continually make sacrifices, you know, Christ just made that sacrifice once. He didn't have to do it again and again. Christ doesn't have to go every time we sin. Christ doesn't have to go and die on the cross again for our sins. His blood doesn't have to be shed again and again. <clears throat> His blood is pure and perfect. And because of that, the one sacrifice he made on the cross, his death and his burial and his resurrection on the third day, that gave us the forgiveness of sins. You know, it was it was just like the priest of all priests, the high priest, was able to give eternal forgiveness. <clears throat> the death of Christ set in the motion a continuous cleansing for those who would trust in him. You know, we were given the gift of eternal life that he purchased with his blood. You know, thank God we were washed once and, and for all, you know. And just imagine what it'd be like if we had every time we sinned, we had to have, you know, sat, have a sacrifice or have blood shed or whatever it may be, just as they did in the Old Testament. But, you know, Christ was that, that once for all sacrifice for us. Um, just thank God we were washed in the blood of the Lamb. You know, the Bible speaks of the blood of ever, the everlasting covenant in Hebrews. You know, our faith in his blood is, what, is all it takes to settle our sins forgiveness forever and ever, you know. We don't, as pastor was saying this morning, we didn't. We weren't there to witness the death of Christ. We weren't there to witness the crucifixion and his death, and then when he was buried, and then he ro when he rose again. We didn't see that ourselves, but we have faith in his blood. You know, his blood and accepting the Savior to 
and Christ's blood shed for our sins, just as it was shed for all those that have passed on in years previously, all those that have trusted in Christ's blood, we are trusting in Christ's blood by faith. It's faith in his blood that's, that's giving us that hope of eternal life. Um, we also see an accomplishment. You know, the blood is powerful. The songwriter wrote, Would you be free from the burden of sin? There is power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There is wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. John wrote, Thou hast redeemed us to God by thy blood in Re- Revelation. You know, it takes amazing power to be able to do that, to be able to give us complete redemption, to, you know, give us that eternal hope of heaven, to knowing that, you know, we, we trusted in Christ's blood just that once. We didn't have to, you know, re- get saved again and again every time we sin. We just accepted Christ our Savior and accepted his blood and placed faith in his blood as redemption for our sin. And that's all it took. That's just that one time thing. You know, we may fall and we may sin again and we may have, you know, struggles in our lives. But Christ's blood made, covered all those sins. You know, any sins that we commit even after we're saved, you know, Christ gave us that redemption that was eternal. Um, false religions have always denied the blood of Christ and his power. Mary Baker Eddy of the Christian Science Movement wrote, the material blood of Jesus is no more efficacious to cleanse from sin when it was shed upon the first tree than when it was flowing through his veins. R.B. Shine, a Bible teacher in Texas, declared, The red liquid that ran through the veins and arteries of Jesus' mortal body is not related to our salvation. Of course, these teachers and many others like them stand in complete opposition to the Bible and what, what we read in the Bible and what the Bible declares. You know, what? In Hebrews 9.22, it says, Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Without Christ's blood being shed, we can't be saved. Without Christ's blood being shed, you know, we don't have any hope of heaven. We don't have any hope of eternal life at all. We don't have any hope in this life either if we don't have the blood of Christ. And if we're trusting in anything else, then that's just going to last us until we die. And then we have no hope because we didn't place our trust in Christ. So all these other people that don't teach this are teaching the false doctrine and, and leading people to hell. Because people aren't placing their, their trust and, and their faith in Christ's blood. Um, we also see an acquittal. You know, the blood is permanent. To acquit, acquit is a heavy word. It means to pay off, to free, to clear, to absolve, to, um, to free you of, of whatever you're guilty of, to, to give you freedom from it. Um, it has a far-reaching meaning, extending past you know, all, the, all the way to the future. Um, just for an illustration, let's say a, a man is, is acquitted of murder. Um, through this process, it can he can never come back from it. You know, even if more evidence is found, if he's acquitted by the court, even if more evidence is found, he can't be found guilty of that. He's been freed. He's been cleansed from that that crime that he was supposedly committed. You know, even if new evidence came up presented, he cannot be um, found guilty again. You and I are guilty, and we know it. We don't want justice. We want mercy. Um, through Christ, we have mercy. You know, if. If we got justice for our sins, no, none of us would be able to go to heaven. None of us would have that, that hope of heaven. None of us would have, be able to place faith in his blood if we had justice. But God didn't, didn't give us justice. He gave us mercy. He showed mercy on us when he sent his only son to die on the cross for our sins. You know, he didn't have to do that, but he decided to have mercy upon us. He loved us that much. that he would, he would give his only son to shed his precious blood because he knew in Christ's blood is the only way that we could have any hope of heaven. We could have any position with God, any 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 view in the eyes of God is through Christ's blood. Um, and it's all we need is permanent. As we said before, sin forgiven, sin is forgiven and forgotten. Uh, new mercies are new every morning, the Bible says. Not only was our past sin covered, but our present and our future sin were put under the blood of Christ and the trusting Savior. Like I said earlier, you know, any sin we commit is covered in Christ's blood. You know, it's not that we get saved so we have, you know, the freedom of permission to sin. It's that we will sin because we're, we're human beings. We're mortal people who are going to fall and going to stumble. But you know, Christ's blood is forgiveness for our sins, even for the sins we commit after we're saved. So we see that Christ's blood just covers all of our sins for our entire lives. Um, Isaiah said, I, I, have, I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions, and as a cloud thy sin. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. Isaiah 40, 44 and verse 22, we see that you know, Christ has redeemed us. He has given us that, that grace in his eye, and God's eyes through his blood, through his blood that was shed. David spoke to this when he stated, 
as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Psalm 103, 12 tells us that God promised not to remember, remember them again. You know, we, know, we all know that in Christ, the grave is still sins, and, and I, we accepted and placed faith in his blood. You know, it's as if those sins we committed didn't exist. As it says, as far as the east is from the west, as far as, it, so far as you can go east, as far as you can go west, that's how far our sins are, from the depths of the sea, you know, it's as, as if they didn't exist in God's eyes, that's how our sins are, and we've placed our faith in, in Christ's blood. You know, Christ's blood covers both our present sins, you know, both the sins of omission, and also the sins of commission, you know, whether it be things we ought to be doing and we're not doing, whether it be things we're doing or we ought to not be doing, Christ's blood covers all those sins. We can have faith and trust in that. You know, these are covered by his full blood atonement. Um, Jesus' blood continues to atone for our future sins. This is not to say that we can't go ahead and sin with his blood. It's not a license to sin. It's forgiveness for our sins when we do commit them, because we will commit them, and we will fall. And you know, those are the times when we have to ask God to get forgiveness and, and admit that we, fall, that we fell and that we stumbled and ask him to forgive us again. And again, every time we do it, you know, he always will forgive us as, as, as his children. He always will forgive us because he knows we're going to stumble. He knows we're going to, to have trials in our lives, and we're going to, um, as weak human beings, fail. But he, he gives us the promise of his blood to always cover our sins, that it's, it's good enough to cover our sins. You know, we don't need to do anything else. I know many religions teach us of works and, and uh, you know, things. I think of a lot of the Qurans, the terrorists in Islam. I took a, a class at Crown that covered uh, a lot about Islam, and the things they have to do to get what they think is, is heaven, to get access to heaven, and all the things they have to do. You know, they're always working, they're always doing something to try to get to heaven. They try to be good enough or do enough things to, to be pleasing to Allah to be able to go to heaven. You know, many religions teach things like that, but our, our, our beliefs are so simple. You know, God didn't make it complicated for us. He didn't make it something that, that we had to work to do and that we'd, we'd be constantly worrying for doing it good enough or doing enough. You know, all we have to do is place our faith in Christ's blood. That's all we have to do. And his blood is enough to cover our sins. We don't have to add anything to it. We don't have to take anything away from it. That's all it takes is Christ's blood. <coughs> um, and also, Christ, the, Christ's blood is precious. You know, we love to sing, Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. You know, Peter used the term precious to describe the blood of Christ. He said, oh, The precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, just as that lamb that, that was sacrificed in the Old Testament was offered without blemish, without spot. Christ was that lamb that was shed without blemish, without spot, without sin, without anything impure in his being. He was a pure, sinless uh, person who lived on this earth, and his blood was pure, and, and his blood shed for us was pure. You know, you know, I told this story before, um, but I think it was pretty fitting for, for this message tonight. There was a wealthy old man that had an elaborate collection of Van Gogh, Manet, Manet paintings, and many other uh, famous paintings that were worth a, a, a lot of money. And it was his, his dream collection. Um, his only son shared his father's interest in the rare paintings. Um, they traveled around the world buying these paintings wherever they, would, they could find them. And his son enlisted in the army and was placed in a medical corps. In a severe battle, while carrying a wounded soldier to safety, the son was seriously wounded himself, and he died from the, his wounds. The mother was dead already, and the news of the tragedy devastated the old father. He grieved in loneliness for months. But then one day, a, a knock came on his door, and he responded and found a young man with a package. The young man explained that he was the one, one of the several soldiers that his, his son had carried to safety and had been treated and had brought back up to health. You know, knowing of, of his interest in paintings, he had uh, painted a picture of his son and presented it to the father as a gift. The painting was not rare, it wasn't anything special, but it was precious to the father because it was a painting of, of his son, of the, the son that he loved so much. The man moved a very valuable painting to the mantel and placed the picture of his son in his place. Hour after hour he sat in the rocker and gazed up at the image of his beloved son. When death came, his art collection was put up for sale by auction. Hundreds of collectors came to bid. The auctioneer announced that the, that the will stated that the picture of the son was to be auctioned first. A moan of disappointment could be heard from the crowd. Let's get on with the real paintings, one was heard to say. The son's picture was held up by the auctioneer, and the auctioneer asked, Will you give me a hundred dollars? Fifty? Twenty-five? There was no response. A kind old gentleman in the back that had known the family um, asked, Will you take ten dollars? Sold, said the auctioneer. 
Good, cried the crowd. Now we can get on with the auction. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the auction, announced the auctioneer. The crowd was puzzled and upset. They had came all these miles, and they wanted to buy this expensive, rare artwork. And now the auction was over. Ladies and gentlemen, that, that concludes the auction. Um, the will declared that the son's picture was to be sold, and the person who took it would get all the rest. The old man who had paid ten dollars for the picture of his son that he cared about was suddenly amazed at the fact that he now owned all the value of the paintings that the, that the father had owned. You know, just as that father had valued his son, you know, God valued his son that he loved us so much that he he shed caused his son to go on the cross to be to spill his blood to be shed for us. And Christ is that that pure lamb, that pure perfect Son of God whose blood was shed, guilty sinners. You know, when a person takes the Son of God, everything God has included, you know, we become heirs with Christ. As we, as we read in, in, in the Bible, we become heirs, joint heirs with Christ. I mean, the precious blood has made it all possible. Just as the, the older man that bought the $10 painting with uh, the son, the young man that he cared about, when he bought that $10 painting with the young man he cared about, he got all the rest of the paintings, millions of dollars worth of, of rare and collectible paintings that came with it. And when we accept Christ as Savior, when we accept the Son, we get everything that comes with it. We're joint heirs with Christ. So everything that God has promised to us will come with that, with our salvation. You know, I, it, God doesn't promise that we'll have an easy life on this earth, that we'll have riches, that we'll have fame. But he promises us that we have that, that assurance of salvation, we have that blood when we place our faith in it. And that you know, whatever we face in this earth, we know that we have that hope of heaven. We know that Christ is in with us along the way, and he has a plan for us on this earth, even if our life is on this earth isn't everything we dreamed it to be. You know, we know that we can live a life that's honoring to Christ, and that in heaven we will be rewarded for anything we've done for Christ. We have that, that hope of heaven, just as this older man bought all these millions of dollars worth of, of artwork just by accepting his son. This is the same way with our salvation. We also see the blood is protected. Um, if you remember back to the Old Testament, Exodus 12, the blood was sprinkled on the door of the Jewish home of the Lord instructed them. If we think back when uh, the children of Israel were in captivity in Egypt, and uh, we know that how God was going to bring his people out of Egypt, and they were having all the plagues going upon Egypt, and one of the final plagues was the death angel was going to pass over, over all the countryside um, on the, during the evening. But the people were told to put the blood of, the, of, of a lamb shed on their doorposts, and the death angel would pass over them. And, they would be, and the firstborn wouldn't be, wouldn't be killed in that family. And by faith, they were trusting in that blood that was shed, the, the blood of the lamb that they shed, and that they put in that doorpost. They trusted that by putting that blood out, their children wouldn't be killed, their, their family wouldn't be killed because of their, their trust in that blood. Um, and it was actually their faith that brought protection. You know, they believed the word of the Lord that he'd given to Moses. Um, they believed it enough to act on it, you know, by following the directions just as the Lord had instructed, you know, they reaped a great benefit. You know, they saw that their family was spared by when the death angel passed because they had faith in God and his word and what he had given to Moses to tell them. They believed enough to act on it. You know, God had said, the blood shall be for you for a token upon your houses where you are. When, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite all the land of Egypt. So when... The death angel was passing through, and all those that didn't have faith in God were, were being killed. And when they saw the blood on the doorpost, when they saw the faith of the family that had trusted in God, the death angel passed over them. You know, it's the same way with us as, as believers. When we accept Christ, we accept his blood, and we place faith in his blood. And when God sees the blood, he passes over us. We, we won't go to hell. We won't um, have to suffer for our sin. Because we have placed our faith in that blood, just as the children of Israel placed their faith in the blood on the doorpost, we are placing our faith in Christ's blood shed for us. But God had said it would be a token upon your houses where they are. It would be a sign, um, just as, as it was with the children of Israel. That blood was a sign of, of their salvation. It was a sign of, you know, they, they were passed over. They were, they were spared. And it was a sign of the blood that was going to be shed when Christ would come and shed his blood on the cross. Um, we still speak of being under the blood. You know, the judgment will not fall on, on those who have placed their faith in Christ and accept him as Savior. But if you've not gotten under that protection of the blood of Christ, um, 
I beg of you to do it today. And I mean, I was listening to everybody in this room because I've said before, but even those of us, we're all saved. You know, there's a world out there that doesn't have that blood on their lives. They haven't placed their faith in the blood. Just as the children of Israel placed their faith in the, in the blood, they fell in the doorpost. And as he placed their, and they placed their faith in the blood of the lamb that was shed for their, for their um, sin, sin offerings. And as we place our faith in Christ's blood, there's a world out there that doesn't know of Christ's blood shed. They haven't accepted Christ's blood into their lives, into their hearts, and they haven't placed their faith in his blood. So do we, do we see the portrait today? You know, we can see Christ's blood. It's the most important thing when it comes to our salvation is Christ's blood was shed for us. God sees it. When he looks at us, that's what God sees. Like we said, he looks through rose-colored glasses. He looks, looks at us, and he doesn't see us. He doesn't see us in our sin and all the blackness and filthiness that we have in our, our lives and our past just because we're human and because we were born in sin and because we commit sin on a daily basis. But he doesn't see that. He sees the blood of Christ in our hearts because he sees that we've placed faith in Christ. We place faith in that blood. Um, so for those of us that accepted Christ as payment for our sins, you know, tonight as we partake of the Lord's Supper, you know, let's remember the sacrifice that Christ did on the cross. You know, the sacrifice that God did when he sent his son to die on the cross for our sins. You know, this isn't, isn't something to take lightly. Um, it's something to really consider or think over and ponder over. You know, just the amazingness of, of what God did for us when he sent his son to die on the cross. And that that blood was shed for us, and it's through that blood that we have the hope of heaven. You know, Christ shed his innocent blood at Calvary for you, he shed it for me. And through that, um, we are pure, we're made pure in God's eyes, and we have that hope of heaven. So just tonight, as, as we go into the, I'll give it over to the pastor in a second, but as we go into the uh, Lord's Supper partaking tonight, just let's think on these things. Of the body that was broken and the blood that was shed, it was broken and it was shed for us. It was so we would have that hope of heaven. You know, I know most of us in here probably know it, all have accepted and placed faith in that blood. But also let us remember that there's a world out there and many millions of people that haven't placed faith in that blood, that don't know where they're going when they die, that don't have that hope of heaven, don't have that, that faith that we have. So let's just remember that as we go in tonight, just be grateful and thankful to the Lord for that sacrifice that he, that he shed for us and for his blood. And just remember that his blood is the most important thing, that that blood is what gives us the forgiveness of our sins and placing faith in that. So as, as we go into the invitation tonight, um, to the communion tonight, let's just remember those things. Uh, the blood is very important. If the blood was never shed, then you and I wouldn't have a way to salvation. Life is in the blood. And uh, that's how we can be saved. That's why uh, these different uh, animals and things like that, they can't be saved uh, through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It took mankind to save mankind. And so we can be saved through that precious blood tonight. And as we enter into... Um, before the services of the Lord's Supper, I challenge you, as the Bible tells us, to examine ourselves. And it, 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 it tells us here to uh, make sure that we don't drink or eat uh, unworthily. And we need to examine ourselves. The Bible tells us, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. And uh, many people will use that as an excuse to keep sin in their life. They'll say, well, I'll just pass the cup tonight. I'll just pass the bread. I'm not going to get things right with God. But this is a time where we get those things right with God. This is a time of cleansing. This is a time where we seriously look at ourselves and we say, God, search me. See if there be a wicked way in me. So as we have this invitation, if the Lord is speaking to you about something you need to get right, I would challenge you to come forward. If uh, you just need to come forward and say, Lord, I've taken for granted the blood you shed for me. Maybe you just need to uh, come down to this altar and say, Lord, uh, help me to remember the blood you shed for me. Help me not to take that for granted. So at this time, as the piano plays, uh, we'll have just a time of examination.